Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, I wish I could be there with you in person. Uh, but man, all of us seem to be all over the place uh, this Christmas season. I'm up here in Virginia uh, spending some time with Amanda's family. And so just looking forward to just sharing a little, just a little bit of a Christmas message uh, with you here uh, this afternoon, this evening. I guess really whenever you're watching it, maybe you're watching this tomorrow. Uh, but I hope you take a few minutes to watch this this morning. And I just want to talk about Bethlehem. And, and I have three stories that take place uh, in Bethlehem. The first takes place in about 1850 B.C., uh, the second takes place around somewhere between 4 BC and 0 AD, uh, 0, I guess you can't say 0 AD, somewhere between 4 BC and 0. Uh, and then another story that takes place in 1850 AD. And so they kind of parallel each other really nicely. I actually don't know exactly when uh, the, the BC story takes place, the 1850 BC. It's approximate, but I like that 1850 and 1850 uh, with the story in the middle. Uh, so starting with the story that happened in 1850 BC, approximately, uh, it's a story where uh, Jacob, now known as Israel, uh, was traveling throughout Canaan. And he had a beloved wife named Rachel. If you remember those stories that he had worked seven years with his uh, uncle Laban in order to uh, marry his daughter Rachel on their wedding night, he marries her to Leah. He didn't even really realize it. That's such a weird story. Uh, and then works another seven years to, to marry Rachel. And he loves Rachel. There's lots of mentions that Rachel's the one he loved. Rachel's the one he loved. But for years, she wasn't having any children. And in fact, he has uh, 10 children from his first wife and his concubines. We can deal with that another time. It's not a Christmas story. Uh, and so he has these 10 other children. And this is what is ultimately going to be the tribes of Israel. Uh, but then finally, 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 uh, Rachel gives him a son. His name is Joseph. And then we get to take off with that story uh, there at the end of Genesis, seeing how God is going to uh, provide for Israel through the misfortune of Joseph. Uh, he is going to provide uh, for his people, Israel. Uh, but then there's a, a little quick story that we get, and it's actually our first introduction to Bethlehem. It's the very first mention of Bethlehem in the Bible. And it's right as Rachel has a second child. And that second child is named Benjamin. And right after having that child, she dies. All right. And where is she buried? She's buried there in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. We don't really get a lot of background on why it was called that. Uh, most likely there were people that made bread somewhere there in Bethlehem. Uh, but that this is where she was buried, and there's a headstone, and it lasted there for a long time. Even in Moses' day, he mentions, like, yeah, you can still go see that. You can still go see that uh, headstone or whatever they used to mark her grave uh, there at that time. So our very first mention of Bethlehem is actually a very sad story. It's a story where uh, they have to leave uh, Rachel there as they are sojourning they're traveling throughout Canaan and they have to leave her and they have to bury her uh, right there and, and this is this first mention so uh, talk about you know a, a message of, of just heartbreak and just pain to, to have a new child come into the world and die in that moment uh, and, and that there's just you know such hope followed by such devastation such uh, you know, just discontentment, such, you know, anytime we deal with like an, an untimely death, uh, there is always this feeling of this doesn't feel right. This is, uh, this doesn't, this feels wrong. This is disconnected from my reality, uh, especially during the holidays when we remember such things. Uh, death is one of those things that remind us that this world is broken. It reminds us that we're in a fallen world. Uh, and so the story of Bethlehem starts with this feeling of brokenness, this feeling of this is wrong, this isn't right. And then we get another story of Bethlehem that comes about 1850 years later. It's now in those days a decree went out from Caesar and Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all the people were on their way to register for the census, each in his own city. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called 
Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So here at Bethlehem, the bread of life is laid in a feeding trough to begin his life. This is from a prophecy uh, all the way back in Micah's day. Uh, that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah and, and that his going places of, from long of old. So we're, he's referencing that God himself, the Ancient of Days, is going to be this child, that he is going to be the Son of God. This is the birthplace of David's descendants. We get, we get this story back in the story of Boaz, uh, where Ruth's first husband was from uh, Bethlehem. She then, they move to Moab. That's where she, they marry Ruth. She follows her, after her husband's death, she follows Naomi back to Jerusalem. And this is where she comes across Boaz, the closest, one of the closest living relatives uh, to her dead husband. And he becomes the kinsman redeemer. He is from Bethlehem. They have children. They have Obed, followed by Jesse, followed by King David. And so when we get here now to Joseph's day, he has his betrothed wife, pregnant uh and so when the census comes they say everybody get back to your hometown this is why they have to travel back to bethlehem uh when the idea of them there being no room in the inn don't don't think the inn doesn't mean you know hotel room there wasn't any room in the hotel the inn was what you would call the living room you would walk into a home it would actually be like a cave you would actually walk down uh they, they would live off the side of like a cliff and so you would the whole it would almost be like in the surface you'd walk down into the house and the first room would be called the inn and since all the family had come back from miles around the inn was full it took them a long time his wife was pregnant they didn't get there quickly and so there was no room so they let him uh stay what would be right next door is where you would keep your animals you wouldn't let your like cow live outside because somebody's going to steal that cow so they kind of move the cow out of the way and say hey you guys can have this little side room all to yourself this is why a manger would have been dug out of a uh side of a uh, the cave wall it would just be like a, a little trough and they would put hay and things like that they clean that out put little swaddling clothes in there and laid uh, the king of the universe the creator of all things uh, in the most humble beginnings imaginable now in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields keeping watch over their flock at night the angel of the lord suddenly stood near them and the glory of the lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened and so the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. And when the angels departed from uh, into the heavens, the shepherds began to say to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem, then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to, Ma found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told to them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured these things in the, uh, treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen, just as it had been told them. Uh, so here comes the the second story uh, that took place in about 1850 uh, A.D. Uh, it took place in Bethlehem. Uh, there is, there's been a church of the nativity uh, since about 300 uh, AD. So uh, Constantine's mother went back to you know, Israel looking for holy sites so that they could preserve them and put a church on them. And sure enough, she traveled to Bethlehem and she asked people, hey, where was Jesus born? And there were multiple people that said, oh yeah, right there. Joseph's family still lives there. This is 300 years later. Now I know for us, 
imagine imagining like a family living in the same place for 300 years seems insane uh not in that part of the world in, in, in the middle east people live there for generations upon generations and so she goes and she finds the place where at least claimed and i think it's a good claim that joseph's family lived and she bought it from them and they built a big giant church on top of it the church of the nativity and has been in practice since the 300s we well, fast forward all the way to about 1850 there were actually three churches that run a church in one so it's one building but three churches running so there's the catholic church side there's the armenian church not armenian church armenian church uh, from the country of armenia and uh the greek orthodox church uh so they all have different times you know when it's nine o'clock it's greek orthodox time when it's ten o'clock it's catholic time i don't i don't actually know i'm just saying they there are different times that they hold different services throughout the day uh, well, there was a time on top of the church in the nativity, there was this big silver star, but it had gotten old and it's now tarnished. It's been in the, you know, in the elements for years now. I can't, I don't know how old that star was. Uh, so the Roman Catholic Church decided, you know what, we want to give God our best. We want to honor Jesus with the best that we have. And so they had this brand new silver cross commit or silver star commissioned to now adorn the top of the church in the nativity. And uh, it, it was, you know, spared no expense. It's beautiful. It's expensive. More, you know, it could probably feed the whole city of Bethlehem uh, for 20 years. But instead, we, we have a silver, uh, a silver star on top of the church. Uh, and so they go and take down the old church. Well, when the, the Orthodox people, when the Greek Orthodox church saw this, they freaked out. They're all about tradition. They're like, no, 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 this church, this star has adorned this church for hundreds of years. How dare you take this down? Why would we want to use something new? What, are you going to have a new religion now? It's a new religion? No, it's the same old religion from old. How dare you replace something old with something new? That's what you Catholics do. And there was this big fight that broke out. And the Orthodox Church actually wrote a letter to Russia, who was the most powerful Orthodox country at the time. And so they wrote a letter to Russia, uh, who then the Tsar of Russia, or King of Russia, whatever it was at that time, uh, wrote a letter to the Roman Catholic Pope and said, hey, do not remove this uh, you know, star. My people that are there are saying this is a great travesty. Do not do it. Uh, and so the, then the Pope goes to his most powerful ally, the King of France, and asks him to write a letter back to Russia saying, don't tell me what to do. All right? And so they write a letter back to Russia saying, you know, how dare you interfere uh, with God's holy Catholic Church and you know, threatens them some more. Uh, well, these letters start going back and forth. And then Turkey, which we would think of as like the Ottoman Empire at this time, that was who was in control of uh, the Palestine area that was in control of Bethlehem at the time. And so they side with the Roman Catholic Church. They were a Muslim uh, a Muslim caliphate, uh, but they sided with the Roman Catholic. They were asked to take sides, and they did. They were just, they were upset at Russia. They had like a little beef going on with Russia. There was some kind of espionage thing that they were accusing Russia of. So they sided with the Roman Catholic Church, and Russia's response was to declare war on the Ottoman Empire. All right, and right when they did that, then Turkey has his its allies in France and England then declared war on Russia. And we call this the Crimean War. It took place from 1853 to 1856. Thousands of people died in this war. And it started kind of by these letters going back and forth because of the star in Bethlehem. So it gets us to ask this question where we see in 1850 BC, there's this brokenness in the world marked in death. You fast forward 1,850 years after Christ, and there's this brokenness that leads in more than one death, but lots of deaths. Like, death was multiplied uh, in this, all around the same city of Bethlehem. So what peace was brought? We, we hear the angels cry, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. What is this peace? And the answer was, in Jesus' first coming, it was not going to be peace between individuals. It was not going to be a peace, even in ourselves, like having to, no longer having to deal with death. It wasn't going to be a peace of not having to deal with sin. It wasn't going to be a peace between the nations. 
Jesus even admits that, like, yeah, I didn't really come to bring peace into families. And kind of I brought a sword. I brought a division. You're either going to believe in Christ or reject him. So what kind of peace did God bring at this time? He certainly brought peace. The peace he brought was between God and men. The peace he brought was between us and God. And so what Jesus is coming here to do in his first coming, as he is... You know, his incarnation begins in Mary's womb. He is now born here in Bethlehem. I love that the census is going on because now it can be proved. There was a time in Jesus' life where the Pharisees accused him and says, Hey, isn't this guy from Nazareth? Isn't the Messiah supposed to be born in Bethlehem? And Jesus doesn't respond. But we also don't see the Pharisees ever bring up that argument again. Because you know what they did? They went down to the courthouse, pulled the records of the census. And sure enough, they find Joseph... And Mary, with a little eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus that had been born the night before, listed on the census. So they can prove that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. All right, And so that argument is gone. So now Jesus has come into the world, but his purpose of his coming was not to bring peace amongst people in the world. It was to bring peace between us and God, that we were in rebellion to God. We were going to have to face ultimate judgment away from God for all eternity. But what Jesus did in himself, he is God, he is man. He is bridging the gap between both God and men in his very being. He certainly does that on the cross. All right? He bridges the gap there at the cross. We see it as a tree that separates mankind, where Adam and Eve eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it brought separation between man and God. And now here on this tree, Jesus is uniting God and man again together. And so he is bringing peace. So what we could be reminded, anytime you sing of joy, anytime you sing of peace, anytime you sing of love, uh, this Christmas season, and I can't attach copyrighted songs to this video, so you're going to have to pick your favorite Christmas songs uh, to play during this service. Otherwise, uh, I think Facebook and YouTube would shut me down. Uh, but pick your favorite song, and you're going to hear these cries of peace and joy and love and hope. Understand that that is a call between us and God, that we were enemies, we were separate from God, and what Jesus did was unite us. The peace we have is to know that God loves us and we're not going to face his judgment. And we can now rest in our Savior and King. We can rest in the arms of God knowing that those are comforting arms, not judgmental arms. We can know those are arms of peace and love and not arms of condemnation and judgment. Because Jesus brought peace into the world. The angels understood this. As they go and declare and they immediately obey, we got to see this. we got to see this, Jesus. They understood that he was bringing peace to the world, but the peace of the world was between the world and God. Jesus brought peace. I hope you have experienced that peace this Christmas season. He is always welcoming us with open arms for anybody who believes and trusts in him. I wish you and your family a merry, merry Christmas, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless.